always do with our number 10. Meet Alex and Donna Vucinas. They met at work and fell in love. Aww. She was from Florida and he was from Canada. Just days before they got married, Alex was looking through some of Donna's childhood photos and stumbled across this one of her posing at Disneyland with her brothers. Alex looked closely in the background and oh my god, he realized the man in the background was his own father and the boy he was pushing was him. What? That is unbelievable. They were from different countries, but somehow ended up in the same childhood picture together 20 years before they married at Disneyland as kids. Is that fate? Is that fate? I think that's fate. Moving on to number nine, we have the start and end of America's Civil War. In July of 1861, Wilmer McLean's Virginia home was involved in the first battle of Bull Run. In fact, the general of the battle wrote a diary entry about a candidate ball crashing through McLean's kitchen. He wrote, and I quote, a federal shell fell into the fireplace of my headquarters at the McLean house. Now, due to safety reasons, McLean moved his family home from the front lines to a new home in Appomattox County. Well, guess what? The battle ended up ending in his parlor in 1865. So it started in his backyard and ended in his parlor. So he was involved in the beginning and the end. Moving on to number eight, we have the birth chart. This story was shared by Raina Lee R on Reddit. So according to her, her brother's doctor would always get his chart mixed up at the office. And that's because there was another kid under his care with the same first and last name. To make things weirder, they were both born on the same day, just different months of the same year. And their mothers had the same name. What are the odds of that? I'll be saying that a lot in this video, so get used to it. But for someone to have the same first and last name as you, it's absolutely wild. And the same doctor. I just hope that they met and became best friends. Coming in at number seven, we have The Marks. This story was shared by Pata95 Nishta on Reddit. And this story is about to blow your mind. So according to her, her best friend from elementary school has three sisters. All three sisters grew up to marry engineers. Not only that, but all of their husbands were named Mark. And her best friend, I guess, followed this tradition because when she got older, she also married an engineer named Mark. What are the odds that all husbands' names were Mark and all of them are engineers? This is wild to me. Like, did the sisters do that on purpose? Are all engineers just named Mark? Also, that must be so confusing at family get-togethers and dinners. In our sixth spot, we have the meteor. So it said that the odds of being hit by a meteor is one in 840 million. So the odds of this happening are very, very, very slim. It's next to impossible. Well, the impossible happened to a family in France. One night they were hit by a meteor, which had been flying through space for more than four and a half billion years without hitting a target. Then all of a sudden it just crashed into their home. Then Thankfully, no one was hurt. The odd part here is that the family's last name was Comet. So out of all families and homes to hit, it hit the family with the name Comet. That is truly bizarre. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the lucky numbers. So this story comes from Yamletf on Reddit. According to them, they were working as a call center operator when they asked the caller for her birthday. The caller said it was April 20th, which was the same birthday as the operator. When the next caller rang in, their birthday was April 27th, which was the same birthday as the operator's brothers. So at this point, the operator was like, okay, what is going on? And then the caller told her that maybe it's a sign and that she should go play the lottery with those dates. And that night she went to the grocery store, played with those numbers and ended up winning. It was only $380, but still that's better than nothing. What are the odds that the winning numbers correlated to the caller's birthdays? Coming in at number four, we have the close calls. In 2014, Dutch cyclist Martin de Jong had plans to head from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. He was scheduled to be on Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. But before his flight, he bumped his ticket up to catch a later flight because it was cheaper. That is the airline that was shot down while flying over Eastern Ukraine. All passengers lost their lives. That's not all. In March, he had a flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Again, he decided to bump his ticket up at the last minute to get a cheaper deal. And it's a good thing that he did. He was scheduled to be on Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, the one that disappeared, never to be seen again. So Martin escaped death twice, all because he wanted a better deal and saved some money. 
He's a lucky, lucky man, but also unlucky that he was supposed to be on both of those flights. In our third spot, we have the plum pudding. Mathematician Joseph Mazur shared this creepy coincidence involving French poet Emile de Champs with plum pudding in his book, Luke. So back in the day, a man named Emile was first introduced to plum pudding by a man named Mr. de Forgeboo. From that moment on, every time he had plum pudding, he would encounter Mr. de Forgeboo, and I hope I'm saying his name right. The second time he had plum pudding, he was at a restaurant and ordered it. But the waiter was like, sorry, we just sold the last pudding to this man and points to the back of the restaurant. Lo and behold, it was Mr. DeForgeaboo. A decade later, he went to a dinner party and at the party, they were serving plum pudding. Emile made a joke like, who's this party for, Mr. DeForgeaboo? And at that very moment, he walked through the door. But he wasn't even supposed to be at that party. He had accidentally come to the wrong door on his way to another dinner party. So what are the odds that every time that this man had plum pudding, Mr. DeForgeaboo was there? It's kind of like Beetlejuice, you know, you say his name three times and he'll appear, except in this case, you have plum pudding and he'll appear. Moving on to number two, we have flight 666. Now this one gives me the absolute creeps. On Friday the 13th, flight 666 departed from Copenhagen and landed in Helsinki, AKA H-E-L, hell. Let me say that again for you. Flight 666 flew to hell on Friday the 13th. I don't know about you, but if I was scheduled on that flight, I would cancel immediately. I ain't taking no chances. But thankfully, the flight landed safely in Helsinki. Thank gosh it did because that seems like one cursed flight. It's plain creepy how it lined up exactly like that. Pun intended, get it? Plain creepy. And in our number one spot today, we have the prediction of James Dean's death. On September 30th, 1955, James Dean died in a car accident. He was only 24 years old. And it seems like a man named Alec Guinness actually predicted this would happen. He warned Dean and said, and I quote, if you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. A week later, Dean was involved in a terrible car accident and he sadly lost his life. In fact, Alec had said that the car was sinister, and I think he's right. Later, parts of the car were recovered and resold and placed into other cars. All the car owners who had parts of James Dean's car were also involved in deadly crashes. Not only that, but the mechanic working on the car died after the car rolled off the back of a truck and crushed the legs of the mechanic. So Alec was onto something here and tried to warn Dean. Starting off this countdown, we have the married couple's parents. This story surrounds a couple named Stephen and Helen Lee. A couple of years ago, the pair got engaged when they learned something very freaky about their families. While going through family photos during their engagement party, they found photos of their parents together. Turns out that Stephen's father and Helen's mom had actually dated and were set to get married in Korea in the 1960s. But their parents' parents disapproved, so they didn't. Had they not disapproved, the couple would have never been born. Not only that, but what are the odds that they got together after their parents had already gotten together? Kind of awkward if you ask me. In our ninth spot, we have the dollar bill. Now, this is a pretty wholesome one for you all. When a woman named Esther was young, she had written her name on a couple of dollar bills after a bad breakup. She then told herself that she was going to marry the man that brought the bill back to her. Well, years later, she was dating a man named Paul Gratchen. The day he asked Esther to be his girlfriend, they were at a sandwich shop. As he was paying for the meal, he got handed a dollar bill with the name Esther written on it. The bill she wrote years prior. And in the end, they ended up getting married. Now, how wholesome is that? The universe literally gave her what she had manifested. Coming in at number eight, we have the girls with the red balloon. In 2001, a 10 year old girl named Laura Buxton decided to release a red balloon from her front yard with a message on it. The balloon said, please return to Laura Buxton and it had her address written on it. Well, this balloon traveled 140 miles and ended up landing on the yard of another 10 year old girl's house. This girl's name was also Laura Buxton. Like what are the odds? The two Laura Buxtons ended up meeting and they discovered that they had tons of similarities, not just their age and name. For example, they both had a guinea pig, a gray rabbit, and a three-year-old chocolate lab. They both also looked alike and dressed alike. I'm telling you, this is just way too freaky. Like, what are the odds? I'm gonna be saying that a lot in this video. What are the odds? Moving on to number seven, we have Mark Twain and Haley's Comet. 
Every 76 years, Halley's Comet is visible to the naked eye as it soars past Earth. Well, American writer Mark Twain was born on one of Halley's Comet's passing in 1835. The next year that the comet was said to pass was in 1910, and Mark Twain predicted that he was going to die that year. He said that he came into the world with the comet and that he was going to leave the world with the comet as well. And Mark Twain was right. Mark Twain passed one day after the comet's closest approach in 1910. So not only did Mark Twain predict his own death, but his birth and death both seamlessly lined up with Halley's Comet. How freaky. In our sixth spot, we have Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup has been named the luckiest woman as well as the unluckiest woman. She also has been given the name Miss Unsinkable, and I'll explain how she got those nicknames in just a second. So Violet was a stewardess and nurse who was on board three big sister ships when disaster struck each of them. It started with the HMS Olympic. She was on board the ship when it collided with the HMS Hawk. Then she was on the HMHS Britannic when it struck a mine at sea. And lastly, she was on board the Titanic and she managed to escape all three of these disasters. At this point, she probably was cursed. And after the first accident, she shouldn't have gotten back on any ships ever again. So that's why she's been given the name, the luckiest, unluckiest woman to live. Next up at number five, we're going back to Detroit in 1937, where a street sweeper named Joseph Figlock was out, you know, sweeping the streets when a baby fell out of the sky and hit him on the head and shoulder. The baby had fallen from the fourth story of a nearby building and likely would have been killed if Joseph was not there to stop the fall. That was strange, but Joseph carried on with his life for another year, but then, while out sweeping a completely different street, another baby landed on him from a nearby building. Again, Again, it hit Joseph on the head and again the baby survived. This guy was like the strangest superhero of all time, saving babies with the power of his cushiony head. In our fourth spot today we have Harry Zigland. Now this story is kind of controversial. Some say it's an old wives tale. Others say that it actually did happen. Now if it did happen, then this is the definition of karma. So back in the day, there was a man named Harry Zigland who broke a woman's heart. She was so heartbroken that she took her own life. Her brother was so devastated and angry at Harry that he vowed to get revenge on him. So he went out to find Harry with his gun and shot at him. Harry fell to the floor and the brother, thinking that he had succeeded in killing him, grabbed his gun and took his own life. But Harry survived. The bullet didn't strike him. Instead, it hit and got lodged into a nearby tree. Three years later, Henry was using dynamite to remove the tree. When he blew it up, the explosion sent the bullet out of the tree and it hit and instantly killed him. It took Karma three years, but it finally caught up to him. Coming in at number three, we have the Hoover Dam. Over the course of the construction of the Hoover Dam, there were 96 deaths. The first death was of a man named J.G. or George Turney. It occurred on December 20th, 1922. He sadly lost his life after drowning in the dam. 14 years later, on the exact anniversary of this guy's death, his son, Patrick Turney, lost his life. He fell from an electrical tower and died. This was also the final death reported during the construction of the dam meaning the first man to die and the last man were father and son, and it happened on the exact same day. Coming in at number two, we have Jack Frost and other stories. Some things are just meant to be, and you'll believe this once you hear this next story. Children's book author Anne Parrish was with her husband in Paris when they stopped by an antique bookshop from the 1920s. While in there, she found a copy of Jack Frost and other stories. She told her husband that that was her favorite book as a child. Well, when he opened the book, it had her name written inside of it. It read Anne Parrish, 209N Weber Street, Colorado Springs. So not only did it have Anne's name in the book, but it had the place she grew up in, Colorado Springs. Seems like Anne was meant to find that book. And in our number one spot today, we have the two presidents. It turns out that Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy share a lot of eerie coincidences. Besides the fact that they both were American presidents, they both were killed by a gunshot wound to the back of the head, they both passed away on a Friday, they both died before a celebration, Kennedy was assassinated on the eve of Thanksgiving, Lincoln died right before Easter, and each were accompanied by their wife and another couple when they were killed. 
but that's not all. They both had best friends named Billy Graham, both Billies had four children, and they both had secretaries named after the other president. Kennedy's secretary was Miss Lincoln, Lincoln's secretary was John. But wait, there's even more. Both of their successors were vice presidents called Johnson. The freakiest coincidence, Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater. Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln made by Ford. Whoa, boom, mic drop. Isn't that insane? I thought so, it blew my mind. Starting off this countdown, we have Thomas W. Lawson. Thomas W. Lawson was a British stockbroker who in 1907 published a book called Friday the 13th. The story was about a stockbroker who tried to make the entire stock market crash on Friday the 13th, hence the name of the book. Little did he know that he would eerily predict the future. On Friday, December 13th of 1907, a ship named Thomas W. Lawson, named after a completely different Thomas W. Lawson, not the author, set sail on her first transatlantic voyage. That day, she sank. Isn't that bizarre? A ship named Thomas W. Lawson crashed and sunk on Friday the 13th. I'm telling you, this guy predicted the future whether he meant to or not. In our ninth spot, we have Barbary Shore. Barbary Shore is a novel written by Norman Mailer. It's about a character who rents a room in a Brooklyn boarding house in order to write a novel. Then a minor character is introduced and it's his neighbor who turns out to be a Russian spy. Well, after the novel was finished, Mailer's neighbor was arrested for being a Russian spy and hiding out in his apartment just like in the book he wrote. And he had no prior knowledge of his neighbor. Now that's freaky. In our eighth spot, we have The Omen. The Omen is a 1976 horror movie that caused a number of real life tragedies. As a result, it's been called a real life horror movie or a cursed one. A number of the cast members got into horrific accidents. For example, special effects consultant John Richardson got into a crash and his assistant Liz Moore was cut in half during an accident, similar to the death of a character in the actual film. That's not all. The screenwriter and executive producer were both on different planes that got struck by lightning on different occasions. It's just wild how so many cast and crew members experienced tragedy after working on the film. Is this a coincidence or is the film actually cursed? In our seventh spot, we have William Shakespeare. More like William Shookspeare, because I was shook after hearing this. So Psalm 46 in the book of Psalm reads, here was I like a psalm. The freaky part is that this is an anagram for William Shakespeare, arranged letters and it spells his name. But wait, it gets weirder. The 46th word in Psalm 46 in the King James Bible is shake, and the 46th word from the end is spear. And how old was William Shakespeare when the King James Bible was first completed? He was 46 years old. So someone explain this to me, please go ahead. Try and explain this. Coming in at number six, we have the Jim twins. In 1940, a set of twins were put up for adoption when they were only three weeks old. They both ended up getting adopted by different parents, so they got separated. They were raised differently. However, both lived near identical lives. First off, we got their names. Both adoptive parents named their son James, but the boys wanted to be called Jim. So you got Jim Lewis and Jim Springer. Keep in mind, they lived separately and had no contact with each other. It gets weirder. Both Jims had a dog. They both named the dog the same. They named it Toy. In school, they both enjoyed math and carpentry, but had trouble with spelling. Both Jims went on to marry a woman named Linda, then they both ended up divorcing Linda, and then they married again. This time, they both married a woman named Betty. So you're telling me that they both married someone with the same name, not once, but twice? What are the odds? Later on in life, both of them had a son. They both named their sons James Allen. They both drove the same car in the same color and both were chain smokers. In 1979, both the Jims actually met each other and realized just how similar they were. Like this is wild. They had the same habits and everything. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Danielle Dutoit. The irony behind this next story is mind blowing. So Danielle de Toit was a South African astronomer. Over his life, he discovered and co-discovered several comets. 
He also spent his days giving lectures. On September 28th, 1981, he gave a lecture on how death can strike anyone at any time. As soon as the lecture was done, he popped a mint into his mouth. The mint then slid to the back of his throat, he choked on it, and died right then and there. So yeah, I'd say his lecture was pretty spot on. In our fourth spot today, we have the license plate. World War I began after Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in his car on June 28, 1914. The car's license plate read AIII-118, which wasn't a big deal until people realized that this was the date that World War I ended, November 11, 1918, aka 11-11-18 just like the license plate. Now, this car was placed in a museum in Austria and it sat there for almost two decades before a British tourist noticed the significance of the license plate. So literally, World War I started and ended with this car. Coming in at number three, we have Catherine and Mary Kelly. On November 28, 1888, a woman named Catherine Eddowes was arrested after being found drunk on the streets of London. When she was taken in by the police, she gave them a fake name. She told them her name was Mary Kelly. Later, she was released. However, that night she was murdered by none other than Jack the Ripper. The freakiest part is that that same night, Jack went on to kill another woman, none other than Mary Kelly. The random fake name that Catherine gave the police, who is actually a real person and also got killed. How scary, but also how tragic. In our second spot, we have the Disney lovers. In the early 2000s, engaged couple Alex and Donna were looking through some old photos when they came across one of Donna and her siblings at Disney. While in the background of the photo, they spotted none other than Alex and his family. Alex is the boy in the stroller being pushed by his father. So not only did they go to Disney at the same time, they just so happened to be in the same spot at the same time and got it on camera. I guess that's how you know that your love was meant to be. Years later, they decided to take their kids to Disney and recreate this iconic photo. And in our number one spot today, we have the lightning strike. There is a 1 in 500,000 chance of being hit by lightning. There's a 1 in 9 million chance of being struck by lightning twice. What about being struck by lightning three different times? This happened to a man named Major Walter Summerford. He was struck by lightning three different times throughout his life and survived. Not only that, but when he did pass away, his gravestone was also struck by lightning. What are the odds of that? Like, did he piss off Zeus or something? Coming in at number 10, we have Stephen Hawking's death day. Stephen Hawking was one of the most brilliant minds of our time and left a scientific legacy that humans will revere for centuries to come. It was definitely a sad day when he died on March 14th, 2018. Wait a minute. Isn't that 3.14? Aren't those the first three numbers of pi? Why, yes. Ye yes, it yes, it is. But wait, that's not all. Not only does Hawking's death day coincide with Pi, it also lands on Albert Einstein's birthday and on the day that Galileo also met his end. Hmm, I guess great minds think alike. Moving on to number nine, we have the church fire. On March 1st of 1950 at 7.25 p.m., a church exploded in Beatrice, Nebraska. At 7.20, a choir practice had begun, except none of the 15 choir members were there. And it's lucky that they weren't or else they would have perished in the fire. Turns out that all 15 members arrived late due to personal reasons. So they were nowhere near the church when it exploded. What are the odds that all 15 members were running late? This story could have ended in tragedy. Thankfully, it didn't. Moving on to number eight, we have the wedding vows. In 2007, Fred and Lynette Dubendorf were walking along a beach clearing up some litter when they found a message in a bottle. After they opened it, they found it contained the marriage vows of another couple. Upon closer inspection, they found that their marriage dates matched. The couple who created the vows in the bottle were married on August 18th of that year. The Dubendorfs were married August 18th of 1980. 
1879. Both couples were also married on beaches. The Dubendorfs were in complete shock and actually reached out to the other couple. Thankfully, the couple left their address in the bottle. Both couples now believe that their marriages were meant to be. Especially Matt and Melody, the couple that wrote the vows in a bottle, who had several failed marriages before finding each other. They were skeptical about getting married again, but this to them is a sign that it was meant to be. Moving on to number seven, we have Edgar Allan Poe. This is one of the freakiest coincidences I have ever read about. So in 1838, Edgar Allan Poe wrote his only complete novel. It was called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. The the book was about Arthur Pym who goes on a nautical adventure. He hops on a boat as a stowaway and hides out there. But while aboard the ship, a mutiny occurs and a number of crew members lose their life. There's only four members aboard the ship now. One of the men was named Richard Parker. They kept him alive to help them control the ship. However, they encountered a terrible, terrible storm and things went south. The remaining four people on board are struggling to find food. So Richard was like, let's draw straws. Whoever gets the shortest straw will be killed and the others can eat them. So they did as Richard said, and he ended up drawing the shortest straw and then was eaten by his crew members. Believe it or not, but 46 years after that book was published, this happened in real life. In May of 1884, four men were traveling from England to Australia when they found themselves fighting for their lives. The men decided to draw straws and see who they should eat. The cabin boy drew the smallest straw. What was the cabin's boy's name? Richard Parker the same name as the guy who got eaten in the book. What are the odds of that? Is Edgar Allan Poe a psychic or did he write history or both? Moving on to number six, we have Redbox. This story comes from Madney25 on Reddit. A couple of years ago, her and her friend went to Redbox to see if they could rent the movie Tron. For those of you who don't know what Redbox is, basically it's an American video rental company that has these little kiosks you can go to and pick what movie you want and then you can rent it and you'll get the DVD. So they went there, but they found out that they didn't have Tron. So they were like, okay, screw it. Let's just rent another movie. Well, when they opened up the DVD case, turns out that inside was the movie Tron. Someone had put it back in the wrong case. But what are the odds? Because that's the movie that they wanted to see in the first place. Like out of all the DVDs they could have gotten, they got the one with the switched disc. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with My Way. My Way is a beautiful song by Frank Sinatra, but it also might be cursed. Why do I say that? Well, at least six people were killed in the Philippines between 2000 and 2010 while singing My Way. Karaoke is a pretty popular pastime in the Philippines. However, this song is now associated with bad luck there. One time a man was shot by a security guard for singing this song badly at a bar. Others were killed for hogging the microphone, and quite a few were killed for singing the song on repeat. Due to the repeated deaths, the song is actually banned from ever being sung or played in bars. In our fourth spot, we have the birthdays. According to a woman named Carrie Lee Simmons, her and her best friend share a number of eerie similarities. First, they both have the same birthdays. Not only that, but turns out that they were born in the same hospital and their mothers shared the same recovery room. Keep in mind that their mothers were complete strangers. Then 17 years later, the two connected and became best friends. When they found out that they were practically born beside each other, they completely freaked out. That's how you know that friendship is meant to be. In our third spot, we have The Sign. This next story is from Reddit user EricFP23. So the day in which her grandfather died, her mother had been sitting in bed next to him, comforting him. Before he passed, she whispered to him, tell Richie I say hi. Richie was her ex-husband who had passed away a couple years earlier. A couple of days after her grandfather's passing, Erica and her mom were at Walgreens when all of a sudden a huge truck drove by with some writing written on the side of it. It read, Richie says hi. I am speechless. Like, that's just goosebumps. And Erica and her mom were speechless too. It's either just a super eerie coincidence or Richie sent that message from the grave. Moving on to number two, we have the taxi driver. I'm sorry, but this one is a little depressing compared to the other stories on today's list. In 1974, a man was riding his moped scooter in Bermuda when he was struck and killed by a taxi. One year later, his twin brother was riding the exact same scooter when he was struck and killed killed by a taxi as well. The taxi was driven by the exact same driver who took his brother's life. So not only did the twins die the exact same way, but they had been killed by the exact same person. 
And in our number one spot today, we have the life savior. When Su Wei Fong of China was 50 years old, he was outside near a river by his home when he saw a boy drowning. So he jumped in and saved his life. 30 years later, he rescued another boy from the river. This boy had slipped and fell into the river and didn't know how to swim. Once again, Wei Fong jumped in and saved this boy's life. Well, it turns out that the two people he saved were related. They were father and son. 30 years ago, he saved the boy's father from drowning. Then he saved the father's son from drowning in the same river. So they believe that this man is their guardian angel. All right, at number 10, a leading Nazi was on a last minute vacation during the D-Day landings. A huge British wartime victory could have been very different if a German field marshal hadn't chosen that exact time to take his wife away. During the Normandy Storm of 1944, Erwin Rommel, known as Desert Fox, decided to take his wife on a surprise trip for her birthday. He was a key strategist and a military tactician, and had he been in Normandy, things could have turned out very differently. The scary thing about this coincidence is how different the world could be right now if the Allies lost the battle. Coming in at number nine, we have Mark Twain and Haley's comment. They came in together, they must go out together. This was something Twain said before he died. Mark Twain was born on November 30th, 1835, which was the same year, and two weeks after, Haley's Comet flew past. During his time on Earth, Twain was famous for such works as Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and many more. He was awesome. Twain was convinced next time the Haley Comet dropped by, that would be his time to go, and he was right. On April 21st, 1910, Mark Twain met his end, which was coincidentally the day after the comet passed by once again. Coming in at number eight, The Simpsons in general. One of the longest running TV shows in history, The Simpsons are notorious for somehow predicting outrageous events, including the president of the United States was gonna be Donald Trump. If you watched the episode with Donald Trump as president today, you would probably have thought it was just another comedic, satirical episode of a TV show to do with the time. But the thing is, they wrote that sucker 19 years ago. How on earth did they guess that? With the show running for over 30 years, themes occurring in the show are eventually gonna happen in real life, maybe. But this? They predicted a three-eyed fish, a circus entertainer getting attacked mid-performance, even the Ebola outbreak. I think we can safely put down The Simpsons as one large coincidence, considering the amount they've had. They happen so often that the questions of whether they are psychic or actually secretly controlling events, I don't know, these are just things we need to know. Like right now, <laughs> these kinds of coincidences just need an explanation. Coming in at number seven, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Kelly. Jack the Ripper. That's, yeah, that's pretty much all I need to say to get all the cold case crime fanatics interested. Are you ready? This next coincidence is a lot darker. Catherine Eddowes was one of Jack the Ripper's victims, taken only an hour after Elizabeth Stride. But this is where things get creepier. That day, Eddowes was found passed out drunk on the street and was arrested. Once she was sober enough to go home, she ended up giving the police a fake name, Mary Kelly. That same night, Eddowes was murdered, and guess who would follow in her footsteps? A woman named Mary Jane Kelly. That's ridiculous. Like, that just makes me wonder whether it actually, I know they solved the crime, but that makes me wonder as to whether, I don't know, uh, Jack the Ripper was actually in the police force. How could that happen? How how can we explain that? That's just, that's just too wild. Coming in at number six, we have Royce Burton. Are you ever right in the middle of telling a story when the very person you're talking about like walks into the room? There are two subtle reactions. One, pretend you weren't talking about them. And then you're like, oh, talking about them. Just pretend, just pretend. What? Oh, what's that? Oh, who's that? Oh, hey, that's what you do. And the second one, you just look at them and go, oh, speak of the devil. Royce Burton had the latter reaction, though it was kind of cooler. When the very stranger who saved his life strolled in right as he mentioned him. Royce used to be a Texas Ranger, and one night while patrolling the Rio Grande in 1940, he got lost and tried to climb up the cliff to find his way. As he was nearing the edge, he almost fell, but then the hand of a man named Joe, like, reached out and hoisted him up. The two men lost contact when they both joined the war, and 25 years later, Burton had become a teacher and he was in the middle of the story when Joe strolled in. Not missing a beat, Burton said, I'll let Joe finish the story. And his whole class were like, what? These guys hadn't seen each other in 25 years. And apparently Joe had been looking for him and the rest is the rest of the story you know. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Anthony Hopkins. In the early 1970s, Anthony Hopkins was casted to play Koista in The Girl from Petrovka. 
This film was based on the book of the same name. Now, to prepare for the role, he was going to read the book. However, he was unable to find any copy of the book in any bookstore. He searched all over the place, but to no avail. Then, randomly one day, as he was sitting in the London tube station, he found a copy of that book just laying around. Not only that, but when he opened the book, he found that it was signed by its author. Literally, the universe brought him what he was looking for. What are the odds of someone leaving that book behind and then Anthony finding it? The very book he was desperately looking for. Coming in at number four, speaking of signs, many people often look for the right signs when making a big decision or when looking for love. After going through a rough breakup, Esther Gracken wrote her name on several dollar bills and promised herself that she would only marry the man who brought one back to her. Wow, wouldn't you know, a few years later, a man named Paul dating Esther for a while, and he decided one day he's gonna ask her to be his girlfriend. That same day, as he was going to pay for his sandwich, he noticed that his dollar bill had Esther's name on it written in pencil. Weird, he was just thinking about her. He decided to frame it and save it for her as a gift. When she got it, she gasped, but didn't say anything until a few years later, because she didn't want to jinx it, when they were married. That was when she told him the story, and the two have lived happily ever since. Can't be explained, but it's pretty damn cute. Coming in at number three, Parent Trap. So first off, consider the chances of actually conceiving twins. About one in 250, so that's already a cool thing. But then, imagine you pull a parent trap and discover you have actually had a twin your entire life, but you are separated at birth, and then you find out that not only do you look identical, your lives are too. This is exactly what happened to two men when they were reunited at age 39. They were both named James, they both grew up to be police officers, and both their wives were named Linda. Each also had a son named James Allen and a dog named Toy. Then they both got divorced and both married a woman named Betty. What are the chances of that? More like one one in a billion than one in 250. Coming in at number two, we have Richard Parker and Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe, master of the macabre. This man's mind went to some pretty dark, albeit creative places. Some even say he predicted the future, which could be the only explanation for this coincidence. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket is one of his most terrifying, as it recounts the tale of sailors forced to eat a cabin boy named Richard Parker after being stranded on a boat after a shipwreck. People guffawed at Poe when he said that this was based off a true story, though there were none like it at the time. What is insanely creepy about the story is that 50 years later, the exact same event happened, mimicking the story in eerily close ways. The most ominous being that the boy the real sailors ate, his name was Richard Parker. And coming in at number one, Violet Jessup. Luck and coincidence often go hand in hand, especially for Violet Jessup. They called the Titanic unsinkable, but I think they meant her. This woman survived not one, not two, but three shipwrecks, including the aforementioned Titanic. She was either really lucky or a bad omen or both. Probably both. She worked as a nurse and stewardess on the HMS Olympic when it was struck by the HMS Hawk. She was on board the HMHS Britannic when it was hit by a landmine and the Titanic, and we all know that story. Though her lifeboat was almost taken down by the spinning propellers, Violet jumped out just in time and hit her head, but she survived, ending up living to age 83. How could one woman be so unlucky and lucky to survive three iconic shipwrecks? Hmm. Must be a coincidence. Starting off this countdown, we have the married couple's parents. This story surrounds a couple named Stephen and Helen Lee. A couple of years ago, the pair got engaged when they learned something very freaky about their families. While going through family photos during their engagement party, they found photos of their parents together. Turns out that Stephen's father and Helen's mom had actually dated and were set to get married in Korea in the 1960s. But their parents' parents disapproved, so they didn't. Had they not disapproved, the couple would have never been born. Not only that, but what are the odds that they got together after their parents had already gotten together? Kind of awkward if you ask me. Coming into number nine, we have the sinking of the SMS Captain Trafalgar. Okay, so this is some mind altering stuff, stick with me. The British Navy converted a cruise ship, the RMS Carmania, into a warship. They disguised this as an existing German passenger liner called the SMS Captain Trafalgar. This was in order for the vessel to escape detection. Now it worked, and the actual Carmania disguised as the Trafalgar sank a German ship. Now this ship was the actual, legit, real life SMS Captain Trafalgar. Trafalgar, which the Germans had decided to disguise as the RMS Carmania. What? 
Maybe wind that back and listen again if you don't get it because it's taken me like 10 times to understand. This is a freakish coincidence. Anyway, the sinking of the German ship was a huge setback for the German war effort and impacted the way that they moved forward. 51 Germans were killed and 279 captured. Who knows what they could have achieved in the war had they not been on board. Coming into number 8, Seth MacFarlane and Mark Wahlberg missed their flight on 9-11. Family Guy and American Dad creator Seth MacFarlane and actor and former rapper Mark Wahlberg were both supposed to be on planes involved in the 9-11 tax. Both men were scheduled to be on American Airlines Flight 11, which is absolutely insane. Now, coincidentally, McFarlane's travel agent told him the wrong time for the flight and he was late. He missed the plane. Now, this plane would have ended up being flown into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Wahlberg made a last minute decision to fly to Toronto for the film festival instead. If they had died that day, the world would have had no American Dad, The Cleveland Show, or any Wahlberg movies, including Ted, on which the pair collaborated together. And of course, no Wahlbergers, which is obviously a travesty. Coming into number 7, we have Tamerlane's body and Operation Barbarossa coincidence. Tamerlane was a Turco Mongol conqueror and the founder of the Timurid Empire. He lived between 1336 and 1405, but his tomb was opened and his body exhumed by the Soviets just days before the Nazi troops launched a planned attack. His tomb was said to hold a curse that read, When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. Whomsoever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader more terrible than I. Now, three days later, Later, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the largest military invasion of all time, with heavy losses. This is a really, really, really scary coincidence. Barbarossa, of course, was an event that changed the world and also marked the decline in Hitler's stronghold. Coming into number six, we have the weird events surrounding the sinking of the Titanic. Now, the sinking of the Titanic was eerily foreshadowed in Morgan Robertson's The Wreck of the Titan. The story, written in 1898, so 14 years prior to the sinking of the Titanic, depicts scarily similar circumstances. A luxury ship, the Titan, is hailed as unsinkable. It then hits an iceberg on a cold April night and goes down. Sound familiar? Also in the book, the boat is a similar size and length to the Titanic. It travels around the same speed, and drum roll, there were not enough lifeboats for passengers. Is this a weird coincidence, or was Robertson a clairvoyant? Obviously, the sinking of the Titanic really did change history for, you know, ever. Coming in at number five, you know when you meet that special someone and you just know you're meant to be? Some people are so lucky, and this couple got a physical sign that they were in the right place at the right time. Melody Kloska and Matt Burr were married on August 18th on the beautiful Wisconsin beach. A week later, they took their vows, placed them in a bottle, and watched them go on their merry way as they let them drift on Lake Michigan, only to be recovered by Lynette and Fred Dubendorf. To their delight and surprise, the wedding date matched theirs as they were married on August 18th, 1979, almost 28 years earlier. If that's not a sign of forever love, then I don't know what is. We have the savior that was Teddy Roosevelt's thick speech. Theodore Roosevelt was very nearly killed in 1912 when he campaigned for re-election, but he was saved by a thick speech and a glasses case. In an eerie coincidence, Roosevelt placed the folded up paper and glasses case in his breast pocket, the exact area he was shot by a saloon keeper, John Flaming Shrank. He was saved by the contents of his pocket, and as he was not coughing up blood, he concluded that his lung hadn't been pierced, so he would continue his speech. On stage, he said, I shall ask you to be as quiet as possible. I don't know whether you fully understand that I've just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Bull moose. Good. Coming into number three, we have the eerily weird circumstances surrounding the assassinations of President Lincoln and President Kennedy. So the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy have some very, very, very strikingly similar circumstances. Lincoln was the first president to be shot, and Kennedy the last. The pair were both killed on a Friday before a big public holiday. They both sat beside their wives, who weren't injured. Both were succeeded by a vice president named Johnson. Andrew was born in 1808 and Lyndon in 1908. Both had two daughters. At both assassinations, the presidents were with another couple, the male of which were wounded. Lincoln's assassin shot him at a theater and then fled to a warehouse, whereas Kennedy's killer fired at a warehouse, then fled to a theater. Both assassins were then killed by shooters with a cult rival. Just so many weird things. Obviously, both assassinations changed history forever, and like, who knows what was going on there? Coming 
Moving into number 2, we have the 3 cigars that created America. Having grown up in the United Kingdom, I wasn't taught a lot of the finer detail about the American Civil War, so I literally just learned about this insane world altering coincidence while researching for this video, and I'm like pretty shook. Basically in 1862, Confederate Commander Robert E. Lee drafted a war plan called Special Order 191. Now this outlined the movements of the Confederate Brigade over the next few months. This was every Confederate Brigade. He gave copies of these orders to his trusted generals, including the somewhat lazy Stonewall Jackson. Jackson then gave some copies of these to his commanders, even though he probably shouldn't have, because they probably didn't have the authority to have those plans themselves. One of his commanders in turn, Daniel Harvey Hill, totally discarded his. He wrapped them around three cigars and then left them at a campsite when his brigade moved on. Days later, Union scout Barton W. Mitchell found the cigars. As he was about to smoke them, he looked at the wrapping and thought that they looked actually pretty important. It was. The wrapping then ended up in the hands of General George McClellan, who recognized Robert Lee's handwriting. With the plans, the Unions were able to stage a full offensive at the Battle of Antietam. Now, this was a tipping point in the Civil War that gave the North the upper hand. Finally, coming into number one, we have a truly crazy coincidence. This one, this one turn of a corner changed the world forever. That's right, we have Franz Ferdinand getting shot. The spark that ignited World War One was a total coincidence. Scary, really, how the peace of Europe hung in the balance with such fragility. Basically, what happened here was that Austro-Hungarian leader Archduke Franz Ferdinand escaped an initial assassination attempt while he was in Sarajevo. A bomb was thrown under his motorcade by the Serbian Black Hand Gang. Luckily, or so he thought, Ferdinand survived. But in some final destination-style turn of events, the initial assailant, Gravillo Princip, happened to be in a cafe where the Archduke's motorcade drove by again. This time, his car stalled and gave him enough time to shoot him and his wife. This was the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the ignition of World War One, and what a scary coincidence! And this really did change the world forever. Coming in at number ten, we have Stephen Hawking's death day. Stephen Hawking was one of the most brilliant minds of our time and left a scientific legacy that humans will revere for centuries to come. It was definitely a sad day when he died on March 14th, 2018. Wait a minute. Isn't that 3.14? Aren't those the first three numbers of pi? Why yes, yeah, yes, it, yes it is, but wait, that's not all. Not only does Hawking's death day coincide with pi, it also lands on Albert Einstein's birthday and on the day that Galileo also met his end. Hmm, I guess great minds think alike. Coming in at number nine, we have Mark Twain and Haley's Comet. They came in together, they must go out together. This was something Twain said before he died. Mark Twain was born on November 30th, 1835, which was the same year, and two weeks after, Haley's Comet flew past. During his time on Earth, Twain was famous for such works as Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and many more. He was awesome. Twain was convinced next time the Haley Comet dropped by, that would be his time to go, and he was right. On April 21st, 1910, Mark Twain met his end, which was coincidentally the day after the comet passed by once again. Coming in at number 8, The Simpsons in general. One of the longest running TV shows in history, The Simpsons are notorious for somehow predicting outrageous events, including the President of the United States was going to be Donald Trump. If you watched the episode with Donald Trump as President today, you would probably have thought it was just another comedic, satirical episode of a TV show to do with the time. But the thing is, they wrote that sucker 19 years ago. How on earth did they guess that? With the show running for over 30 years, themes occurring in the show are eventually going to happen in real life, maybe. But this? They predicted a three-eyed fish, a circus entertainer getting attacked mid-performance, even the Ebola outbreak. I think we can safely put down The Simpsons as one large coincidence, considering the amount they've had. They happen so often that the questions of whether they are psychic or actually secretly controlling events, I don't know, these are just things we need to know. Like, right now. <laughs> these kinds of coincidences just need an explanation. Coming in at number seven, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Kelly. Jack the Ripper. That's, yeah, that's pretty much all I need to say to get all the cold case crime fanatics interested. Are you ready? This next coincidence is a lot darker. Catherine Eddowes was one of Jack the Ripper's victims, taken only an hour after Elizabeth Stride. But this is where things get creepier. That day, Eddowes was found passed out drunk on the street and was arrested. Once she was sober enough to go home, she ended up giving the police a fake name, Mary Kelly. That same night, Eddowes was murdered, and guess who would follow in her footsteps? A woman named Mary Jane Kelly. That's 
ridiculous. Like that just makes me wonder whether it actually, I know they solved the crime, but that makes me wonder as to whether, I don't know, uh, Jack the Ripper was actually in the police force. How could that happen? How how can we explain that? That's just, that's just too wild. Coming in at number six, we have Royce Burton. Are you ever right in the middle of telling a story when the very person you're talking about like walks into the room? There are two subtle reactions. One, pretend you weren't talking about them. The other one, gossiping. Just pretend, just pretend. What? Oh, what's that? Oh, who's that? Oh, hey, that's what you do. And the second one, you just look at them and go, oh, speak of the devil. Royce Burton had the latter reaction, though it was kind of cooler. When the very stranger who saved his life strolled in right as he mentioned him. Royce used to be a Texas Ranger, and one night while patrolling the Rio Grande in 1940, he got lost and tried to climb up the cliff to find his way. As he was nearing the edge, he almost fell, but then the hand of a man named Joe, like, reached out and hoisted him up. The two men lost contact when they both joined the war and 25 years later, Burton had become a teacher and he was in the middle of the story when Joe strolled in. Not missing a beat, Burton said, I'll let Joe finish the story. And his whole class were like, what? These guys hadn't seen each other in 25 years. And apparently Joe had been looking for him and the rest is the rest of the story you know. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the lucky numbers. So this story comes from Yamletf on Reddit. According to them, they were working as a call center operator when they asked the caller for her birthday. The caller said it was April 20th, which was the same birthday as the operator. When the next caller rang in, their birthday was April 27th, which was the same birthday as the operator's brothers. So at this point, the operator was like, okay, what is going on? And then the caller told her that maybe it's a sign and that she should go play the lottery with those dates. And that night she went to the grocery store, played with those numbers and ended up winning. It was only $380, but still, that's better than nothing. What are the odds that the winning numbers correlated to the caller's birthdays? Coming in at number four, speaking of signs, many people often look for the right signs when making a big decision or when looking for love. After going through a rough breakup, Esther Gracken wrote her name on several dollar bills and promised herself that she would only marry the man who brought one back to her. Wow, what did you know? A few years later, a man named Paul dating Esther for a while, and he decided one day he's gonna ask her to be his girlfriend. That same day, as he was going to pay for his sandwich, he noticed that his dollar bill had Esther's name on it, written in pencil. Weird, he was just thinking about her. He decided to frame it and save it for her as a gift. When she got it, she gasped, but didn't say anything until a few years later, because she didn't want to jinx it, when they were married. That was when she told him the story and the two have lived happily ever since. Can't be explained, but it's pretty damn cute. Coming in at number three, Parent Trap. So first off, consider the chances of actually conceiving twins. About one in 250, so that's already a cool thing. But then imagine you pull a parent trap and discover you have actually had a twin your entire life, but you were separated at birth, and then you find out that not only do you look identical, your lives are too. This is exactly what happened to two men when they were reunited at age 39. They were both named James, they both grew up to be police officers, and both their wives were named Linda. Each also had a son named James Allen and a dog named Toy. Then they both got divorced and both married a woman named Betty. What are the chances of that? More like one, one in a billion than one in 250. Coming in at number two, we have Richard Parker and Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe, master of the macabre. This man's mind went to some pretty dark, albeit creative places. Some even say he predicted the future, which could be the only explanation for this coincidence. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket is one of his most terrifying, as it recounts the tale of sailors forced to eat a cabin boy named Richard Parker after being stranded on a boat after a shipwreck. People guffawed at Poe when he said that this was based off a true story, though there were none like it at the time. What is insanely creepy about the story is that 50 years later, the exact same event happened, mimicking the story in eerily close ways. The most ominous being that the boy the real sailors ate, his name was Richard Parker. And coming in at number one, Violet Jessup. Luck and coincidence often go hand in hand, especially for Violet Jessup. They called the Titanic unsinkable, but I think they meant her. This woman survived not one, not two, but three shipwrecks, including the aforementioned Titanic. She was either really lucky or a bad omen or both. 
Probably both. She worked as a nurse and stewardess on the HMS Olympic when it was struck by the HMS Hawk. She was on board the HMHS Britannic when it was hit by a landmine and the Titanic, and we all know that story. Though her lifeboat was almost taken down by the spinning propellers, Violet jumped out just in time and hit her head, but she survived, ending up living to age 83. How could one woman be so unlucky and lucky to survive three iconic shipwrecks? Hmm, ought to be a coincidence. Starting off this countdown, we have the 4th of July. The 4th of July is a big celebration in America. The holiday marks the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But did you know that a lot of US figures have died on July 4th? In fact, three of the first five US presidents died on this date two within hours of each other. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on July 4th, 1826. The fifth president, James Monroe, exactly five years later passed away as well. Seems to be a deadly date for presidents. Like, what are the odds? Moving on to number nine, we have the church fire. On March 1st of 1950, at 7.25 p.m., a church exploded in Beatrice, Nebraska. At 7.20, a choir practice had begun, except none of the 15 choir members were there. And it's lucky that they weren't, or else they would have perished in the fire. Turns out that all 15 members arrived late due to personal reasons. So they were nowhere near the church when it exploded. What are the odds that all 15 members were running late? This story could have ended in tragedy. Thankfully, it didn't. Moving on to number eight, we have the wedding vows. In 2007, Fred and Lynette Dubendorf were walking along a beach clearing up some litter when they found a message in a bottle. After they opened it, they found it contained the marriage vows of another couple. Upon closer inspection, they found that their marriage dates matched. The couple who created the vows in the bottle were married on August 18th of that year. The Dubendorfs were married August 18th of 1979. Both couples were also married on beaches. The Dubendorf were in complete shock and actually reached out to the other couple. Thankfully, the couple left their address in the bottle. Both couples now believe that their marriages were meant to be. Especially Matt and Melody, the couple that wrote the vows in a bottle, who had several failed marriages before finding each other. They were skeptical about getting married again, but this to them is a sign that it was meant to be. Moving on to number seven, we have Edgar Allan Poe. This is one of the freakiest coincidences I have ever read about. So in 1838, Edgar Allan Poe wrote his only complete novel. It was called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. The the book was about Arthur Pym who goes on a nautical adventure. He hops on a boat as a stowaway and hides out there. But while aboard the ship, a mutiny occurs and a number of crew members lose their life. There's only four members aboard the ship now. One of the men was named Richard Parker. They kept him alive to help them control the ship. However, they encountered a terrible, terrible storm and things went south. The remaining four people on board are struggling to find food. So Richard was like, let's draw straws. Whoever gets the shortest straw will be killed and the others can eat them. So they did as Richard said, and he ended up drawing the shortest straw and then was eaten by his crew members. Believe it or not, but 46 years after that book was published, this happened in real life. In May of 1884, four men were traveling from England to Australia when they found themselves fighting for their lives. The men decided to draw straws and see who they should eat. The cabin boy drew the smallest straw. What was the cabin boy's name? Richard Parker, the same name as the guy who got eaten in the book. What are the odds of that? Is Edgar Allan Poe a psychic or did he write history or both? Moving on to number six, we have Redbox. This story comes from Madney25 on Reddit. A couple of years ago, her and her friend went to Redbox to see if they could rent the movie Tron. For those of you who don't know what Redbox is, basically it's an American video rental company that has these little kiosks you can go to and pick what movie you want and then you can rent it and you'll get the DVD. So they went there, but they found out that they didn't have Tron. So they were like, okay, screw it, let's just rent another movie. Well, when they opened up the DVD case, turns out that inside was the movie Tron. Someone had put it back in the wrong case. But what are the odds? Because that's the movie that they wanted to see in the first place. Like out of all the DVDs they could have gotten, they got the one with the switched disc. 
Coming in at number 5 we have Lewis and Clark almost not making it through their expedition alive. Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark cross the western point of the United States between 1804 and 1806. Their journey and discovery shaped modern America. At one point, the pair were captured by a Native American tribe. Their female guide Sakagawe discerned that the tribe planned to kill or desert them, but it all turned around when she discovered that the leader of the tribe was actually her long lost brother. Weird. She was stolen by a rival tribe when she was younger and she only just recognised him then. As a result, the crew were gifted horses and allowed safe passage. What a coincidence. If that hadn't have happened, well, honestly, who knows. In our fourth spot, we have the birthdays. According to a woman named Carrie Lee Simmons, her and her best friend share a number of eerie similarities. First, they both have the same birthdays. Not only that, but turns out that they were born in the same hospital and their mothers shared the same recovery room. Keep in mind that their mothers were complete strangers. Then, 17 years later, the two connected and became best friends. When they found out that they were practically born beside each other, they completely freaked out. That's how you know that friendship is meant to be. In our third spot, we have The Sign. This next story is from Reddit user EricFP23. So, the day in which her grandfather died, her mother had been sitting in bed next to him, comforting him. Before he passed, she whispered to him, Tell Richie I say hi. Richie was her ex husband who had passed away a couple years earlier. A couple of days after her grandfather's passing, Erica and her mom were at Walgreens when all of a sudden a huge truck drove by with some writing written on the side of it. It read, Richie says hi. I am speechless. Like, that's just goosebumps. And Erica and her mom were speechless too. It's either just a super eerie coincidence or Richie sent that message from the grave. Moving on to number two, we have the taxi driver. I'm sorry, but this one is a little depressing compared to the other stories on today's list. In 1974, a man was riding his moped scooter in Bermuda when he was struck and killed by a taxi. One year later, his twin brother was riding the exact same scooter when he was struck and killed by a taxi as well. The taxi was driven by the exact same driver who took his brother's life. So not only did the twins die the exact same way, but they had been killed by the exact same person. And in our number one spot today, we have the life savior. When Su Wei Fong of China was 50 years old, he was outside near a river by his home when he saw a boy drowning. So he jumped in and saved his life. 30 years later, he rescued another boy from the river. This boy had slipped and fell into the river and didn't know how to swim. Once again, Wei Fong jumped in and saved this boy's life. Well, turns out that the two people he saved were related. They were father and son. 30 years ago, he saved the boy's father from drowning. Then he saved the father's son from drowning in the same river. So they believe that this man is their guardian angel. Start off like Starting off this countdown, we have Jean-Marie Duberry. On February 13th, 1746, a French man named Jean-Marie was executed for the murder of his father. Hundreds of years later, on the exact same day, a man named Jean-Marie Duberry was also sentenced to death. He had also taken the life of his father. So what are the odds that two unrelated people with the same name both killed their fathers and then got executed on the same day? Like that is just way too free. Coming in number 9, we have the story of a 70 year old man from Finland. In 2002, he was riding his bike in a snowstorm in the town of Rahe when he was sadly hit and killed by a truck. It was a tragic and rare occurrence, but just two hours later, another man was hit and killed by a truck while cycling less than a mile down the road. That man was his twin brother. Police said it was unlikely that the second twin had even heard about his brother's death before he died the exact same way. The first officer on the scene said that when she heard the 70 year olds were twin brothers, it made the hair on her back stand on end. Blah, creepy. Next up at number 8, Dr. Peter Scott was the co founder of the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau. Their aim was to identify the legendary creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Now, Dr. Peter Scott wanted to make sure that whatever was lurking beneath the waters there could be protected as an endangered species, but first, he needed to give it a proper Latin name for it to be registered. He called it this Nessitaris Rombop. Terex. Now the word came from ancient Greek and mean the monster of Ness with the diamond shaped fin. But 
But not long after this announcement, a journalist with a bit too much time on their hands, I think, decided to unscramble the letters and they realised they were a perfect anagram of the phrase monster hoax by Sir Peter S. What? That's pretty mental, right? Come on. Can anyone explain that? Can any of you guys explain that? I don't care about all the Nessie pictures out there. You don't need to explain that. Just explain this one for me. Next up at number 7, we have the incredible story of the Jim Twins. In 1940, twin boys were separated at birth in Ohio and adopted by separate families. When they finally tracked each other down at the age of 37, they found out that they had both been named Jim. But all the weirdness was just getting started. Jim and Jim both had childhood dogs that they named Toy. When they grew up, they both married women called Linda. They both then divorced their respective Lindas and remarried women who were both called Betty. They both had a son who they have both named James Allen. They both got tension headaches, smoked the same brand of cigarettes, drove the same model of car and went to the same part of Florida for their vacation. And the list goes on. I think they're both wondering why the other one had to copy them so hard. Like, dude, can you just get your own life, Jim, and stop copying mine, Jim? Number 6. In 1975, the Royal Gazette paper of Bermuda reported that a man called Erskine Eben had been hit and killed by a taxi as he drove his moped. What was crazy about this though was that Erskine's brother had died a year before too. He was killed on the exact same moped. He was hit by the exact same taxi with the exact same taxi driver and here's the real kicker. He was carrying the exact same passenger in the back both times. Whoa! I'm personally surprised the police didn't arrest that passenger because he might have been some sort of like genius murderer who kills his victims with like taxis. Coming in at number five, you know when you meet that special someone and you just know you're meant to be? Some people are so lucky. This couple got a physical sign that they were in the right place at the right time. Melody Kloska and Matt Burr were married on August 18th on the beautiful Wisconsin beach. A week later, they took their vows, placed them in a bottle, and watched them go on their merry way as they let them drift on Lake Michigan, only to be recovered by Lynette and Fred Dubendorf. To their delight and surprise, the wedding date matched theirs as they were married on August 18th, 1979, almost 28 years earlier. If that's not a sign of forever love, then I don't know what is. And now at number four, in the 1920s, there were three Englishmen on a train in Peru. They were all traveling separately and had never met each other and were already pretty surprised that there were three English guys on a train together on the other side of the world. Then they introduced each other. The first man's surname was Bingham. The second man's surname was Powell. The third man raised his eyebrows in shock and announced to the other two that his surname was Bingham Powell. Whoa, the chances of that happening are mental. At number three now, we have the story of Michael Dick from England who wanted to get in touch with his daughter Lisa, who he had not seen for 10 years after splitting up with his wife and moving away from his home. He tried everything, but when all else failed, he asked for some help from a local newspaper. They took this picture you're seeing now for the article. Amazingly, Lisa saw the article, but before she could get in touch, she realized something incredible. She saw herself in the background of the photo photo with her mother. They had actually taken a picture just there moments before and were walking away when Michael took this picture. The very person he was trying to look for after 10 years was in the photo he used to find her. I bet that's going to be a very important family photo. Coming in at number 2, in 1914, a German mother took a picture of her newborn son to be developed in Strasbourg, but before she could collect it, World War I broke out. The woman had to leave the picture there and considered it lost forever. Then, two years later, she was in Frankfurt, over 100 miles away, and now she had a new baby girl. Again, she went to get a picture of her daughter developed, but when she got it back, she was quite annoyed to see that had been some sort of double exposure with someone else's picture in the background. It wasn't someone else's picture, it was her picture of her son that she took two years before over 100 miles away that had somehow ended up in a different store, marked unused and had been sold back to her where she then put another picture of another child of hers on top of it. <sighs> 
And finally at number 1, we're going back to 1899 where a man was struck and killed by lightning while standing in his backyard in Taranto, Italy. That's incredibly unlucky, the chances of that happening are very low, but guess what? 30 years later in 1929 his son was also killed by lightning in the exact same place. Okay. That's crazy, right? That is crazy. A father and a son from the same family being killed by lightning in the same place. What are the chances of that? Well, 20 years after that, on October 8th, 1949, a man called Roller Primada was also killed by lightning on exactly the same spot. He was the son of the second victim and grandson of the first. Incredible. I'm seriously wondering if that family was like made out of metal or something because nobody should attract lightning that much. Thank you.